Welcome to another episode of Reading for Your Life. Once again, I'm Alex. If this is your first episode, I love reading and sharing the books that have taught me something special. In this episode, I want to share Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. This is actually Harari's third book, and I definitely recommend the first two as well. Homo Sapiens, A Brief History of Humanity, delves into what makes us unique as human beings, namely our ability to create meaning. As far as we know, we're the only member of the animal kingdom that imagines meaning into the world. Nations, faith systems, human rights, even money only survive because we believe in them. Some of the things we've created with that power have been very, very good for us, and others have been very bad. But that power is what made us human and carried us forward into the modern world. And there's a question of where it will take us next. In his second book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, Harari turns his attention to the future. Our near complete mastery of the world, our technological reach, our ability to make meaning, puts humans into a unique position of determining our own destiny. The book imagines a future where our ability to find meaning in life is eclipsed by our mindless pursuit of power and pleasure. In that scenario, we might gain near godlike powers, such as eternal life or near omniscience, but we also might yield control to algorithms and put our fate in the hands of AI. In this book, we see Harari plotting the middle course between his last two. Instead of looking back or forward, Harari looks at the challenges we face today and what we can be doing in the present to avoid the worst possible outcomes predicted in Homo Deus. At this point, you might be asking, what makes the 21st century so different anyway? Well, here's the premise of the entire book in one sentence. A global world puts unprecedented pressure on our personal conduct and morality. We're so busy trying to put food on the table or consuming the next thing on Netflix or hating someone that I think threatens my very way of life, I don't really have time to stop and think about what it means to be a good person or even what it means to be human in an era of gene editing and artificial intelligence. Here's the real facts as laid out in the introduction. Homo sapiens cannot wait. Philosophy, religion, science are running out of time. People have debated the meaning of life for thousands of years. We cannot continue this indefinitely. And then later, unless you are happy to entrust the future of life to the mercy of quarterly revenue reports, you need a clear idea of what life is all about. We're sitting on top of a time bomb of our own devising. We, human beings, have come an unimaginable distance. Think of it this way. The earliest recorded human writing was cuneiform in Sumeria about four to 5,000 years ago. The printing press didn't come around until about 600 years ago. The internet started as ARPANET about 40 years ago, and the first iPhone was released just 13 years ago. James Gleck tackles this in his book, Information, A History, A Theory, A Flood. For most of human history, your access to knowledge would have been extremely limited. Even at the great libraries of the world, like the library at Alexandria, you wouldn't have had access to even a shred of what you can Google today. Alexandria is thought to have housed somewhere around 200 to 700,000 books and scrolls. Wikipedia has over 6 million articles in English, and across all of Wikipedia, it's over 50 million articles in 309 languages. If you're listening to this, you are practically more informed than any ancestor back through all of human history. And that same rapid acceleration plays out in nearly every field that you look at. We'll get deeper into the weeds on that when we share Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near in March. But that pace of progress isn't hard to see. I think about my grandfather, who was born around 1920. That means the Wright brothers had completed the first powered, heavier-than-air flight less than 20 years before he was born. But in my grandfather's lifetime, he lived to see man walk on the moon and build multiple space stations. That's one small step for man. The position that we, you and I, and every human alive, holds in the history of human development is profound. We have medicine and armaments and technology that our ancestors could never have dreamed of. Quite literally, things that I take for granted every day, like teleconferencing and cell phones and electric cars, were at best ideas of science fiction even a hundred years ago. And that brings us to the question that Harari is asking with this book. Are we ready for that level of responsibility? Think about it. Our largest religious traditions are founded on documents and teachings from thousands of years ago. Even the United States, which fancies itself a bastion of innovation and the leader of the free world, operates with a government based on a document almost 250 years old. Did George Washington imagine gene therapy when he presided over the Constitutional Convention? 
Was Madison thinking about bump stocks, high-capacity magazines, and tungsten carbide penetrators and armor-piercing bullets when he wrote the Second Amendment? Did Jesus foresee gay conversion therapy or Mohammed expect IEDs? There's a quote from a Robert Browning poem that you may have heard. It goes, Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? He's talking about struggling against our own capacity, to try to accomplish more than we know we can, to do it for the doing in itself. And when you look at where we are now, our capacity for doing, for knowing, for killing, for saving, anything across the board, our reach is exceeding our grasp. We don't really know why we're doing most of the things we're doing anymore. Facebook's motto used to be move fast and break things, not try to solve a problem, not bring something new and amazing into the world, not connect people in new ways and bring the world together. Move fast, break things. Do what we can do because we're capable of it. We'll figure the rest out later. You've all know a Harari wants to caution us to slow down. Ask real questions about the kind of future that we want. And I mean both you and I personally thinking about it. And then come together to build that future. Let's turn to the book and the lessons it offers. The book is broken into five parts, each containing a handful of chapters on specific challenges we faced. Part one covers the technological challenge. Here we look at some of the biggest global trends that are already underway. First is the end of history that never really came. If you haven't heard the phrase before, the end of history means something very specific. In 1992, political economist Francis Fukuyama published The End of History in the Last Man. The argument was that human history is mostly the struggle of one idea against another. We had nation-states against tribal societies, one religion against another. Later, we pitted liberal democracies against totalitarianism. Remember how important humanity's ability to create meaning and ideas is to Harari. This battle of ideas is at the core of what makes us human. The end of history argument goes that as the world matured, we had fewer and fewer warring ideas. Liberal democracy slowly became the default around the world. National economic systems began to rely on one another in a system of global trade, and even faith systems moved to a near universal message of peace. With the fall of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, it seemed like our war of ideas was ending. We'd still have a history of events, but the push and pull of meaning systems looked to be consolidating into a single way forward for all of humanity. Except, of course, that never really happened. Alternatives to liberal democracy like China's hybrid authoritarian model emerged, Fundamentalist religion offered an alternative to universal messages of nonviolence, and we started to see this sharp disconnect between unrestrained global capitalism and sustainable environmentalism. That leaves us all in a very vulnerable place. We're losing faith in the old systems, and we don't really know where to turn. Britain's exit from the European Union and the presidency of Donald Trump are major aberrations from the direction of liberal democracy that everyone was counting on in the early 90s. And listening to the supporters of either is to hear a loss of faith in the status quo, a loss of faith in the idea that the system was working. It's pretty likely that this trend is going to get worse. This mistrust of our old systems is coming at a time when we're also seeing the emergence of technology especially well suited to fanning the flames of belief. The rise of online anti-vaccine or flat earther communities are obvious examples, as is the case of Edgar Welch, the 29-year-old man from North Carolina who entered the Comet Ping Pong Pizza restaurant with guns to investigate the online conspiracy theory called Pizzagate, in which prominent Democrats were supposedly running a secret child sex ring in the restaurant's basement. It's important to note that the restaurant didn't actually have a basement. When we don't have a common system that we all believe in, it's going to become harder and harder for us to work together for any purpose. If we can't work together to make things better, things can only get worse. Harari warns against a future driven by algorithms and automation in which the average worker has little value. We won't just be struggling for rights or our way of life, we could be struggling for relevance. Chapter 2 looks even deeper at the question. The speed of innovation is transforming the marketplace at an incredible pace, and while it's true that technology and automation often create new jobs while it's destroying others, that may not be an even trade. A 50-year-old truck driver may not be in a position to go back to school to train in coding, a former CPA may not make it as a machine learning engineer. Even if we could transition workers from one field to another, the speed of innovation may make their new skills irrelevant by the time they've acquired their new training. Here's one of my favorite examples of how fast things are changing, which Harari actually mentions in the book. In March of 1997, IBM's deep blue chess computer beat Garry Kasparov, then the reigning chess world champion. 
It was the first time that a computer had ever beaten a reigning world champion under normal tournament rules. Deep Blue was cutting edge at the time and relied on brute force computing to play chess. It would evaluate the board and then map out possible outcomes from the current position of the pieces. It could evaluate about 200 million positions per second. Now, to put that into perspective, after the first move on a chessboard, there are about 400 possible positions. After two moves, that jumps to over 70,000. After four moves, there are nearly 300 billion. So even at 200 million positions per second, Deep Blue was seeing only a limited number of possible outcomes. But it was still thought to be more than a match for even the best human players. Fast forward to 2016. The reigning chess program is called Stockfish 8. Stockfish learned a lot from its predecessors. It could process about 70 million positions a second, but it was a lot smarter, meaning it could prune out possible future positions to only look at the most likely outcomes a lot faster. In 12 series of the World Computer Chess Championships, Stockfish was champion seven years and runner-up four years. In only one of those 12 years was it not in one of the top two positions. To test their new machine learning system, Google put their platform, AlphaZero, up against Stockfish. By comparison, AlphaZero can only process a mere 80,000 positions a second. And even more surprising, where traditional systems processed real games to learn outcomes, AlphaZero only learned chess by playing itself. Google told it the basic rules and then let it play both sides of the board. They let it run for nine hours, but it surpassed Stockfish at hour four. In the 100 game series, AlphaZero won 28 times, drew 72, and never lost. You see a similar story when the AlphaZero program entered in the more complicated world of competitive Go. A game was staged against the 18-time world champion Lee Sedol in 2016. AlphaZero won four out of the five games. What's most interesting to me in those cases, though, is what came after the game. Human grandmasters have been astonished at AlphaZero's commentary on human games and are discovering new ways of thinking about strategy. In Go, human players have begun to emulate elements of the program's style. Think about that. In a matter of hours, a machine learning system was able to learn more about these games than humanity. Chess has been around for about 1,500 years. That's 2,500 years for Go. And masters have written books and trained the next generation to pass along all of the insight that we've amassed about these games. But mostly by playing itself for a little while, these programs unlock new insights that surprise us. What happens when these platforms start to scale? They're not bound by our traditional ways of thinking. They may not share our sense of what's valuable or necessary to the functioning of a healthy society, but they're awfully efficient. This brings us to the next big question, data and what we do with it. We are collecting and processing monumental amounts of data every day. Tech companies can finance themselves despite huge operational losses as long as they're collecting large amounts of data because it could be monetized later. Here's an example of what that could mean. Every day we're getting better at understanding genetics, and pretty soon we may have gene therapies to fix a lot of our genetically encoded disadvantages. Today it's illegal in the U.S. for an insurance company to set your rates or deny coverage based on your DNA. But imagine a future where an insurance company offers a choice between gene therapy to remove a potential risk factor or losing your coverage. That's a tough question. But let's go one farther. What if we uncover a genetic risk marker for Alzheimer's? Undergoing treatment guarantees to correct the risk factor, but there's also a small chance that the change could negatively impact your intelligence. Would you take it? Should the insurance company be able to deny you coverage if you don't? And over a generation or two of such choices, what does humanity even look like? A segment of society who takes every treatment might be stronger, more attractive, less prone to disease, and longer lived, while the have-nots, who either can't afford the same access to treatments or choose not to, literally become an underclass. Are both groups human? And does equality take on an entirely new meaning when one group is literally genetically superior? For Harari, we both have to deal with some of these questions, but also decide where we want the power of those decisions to lie. Do we turn over control to those holding our data and designing society around algorithms and efficiency? Or do we want to maintain the power to make decisions for ourselves, even if they may not be better decisions? From here, we turn away from these apocalyptic consequences for the world and turn towards the communities that we build among ourselves and part two, the political challenge. For most of human history, our communities have both brought us together and held us apart. Our religious communities and national identities have often been at the core of human conflict. But in 2016, more human beings died of obesity, 
car accidents, and suicide than human violence. In an era of the most advanced killing technology ever in the history of the world, with failed states and active conflict zones in several parts of the world, we were more likely to die of heart disease, accidents, or killing ourselves than of another human being taking our life. That's an incredible achievement. So does that mean that our communities are finally unified? Not so fast. Harari explores how we form our personal identity and then come together into groups. And as we move more and more of our identity online, we run the risk of becoming alienated from the real people around us. To quote Harari, people estranged from their bodies, senses, and physical environment are likely to feel alienated and disoriented, which is something we'll get more into in May with Matthew Crawford's The World Beyond Your Head. For now, the question is how our communities will move us into the future. For a while, it seemed like our national identities were marching us toward a sense of shared global governance. But we've seen breaks from that trend with the U.S. leaving the Paris Climate Accord and Britain exiting the EU. Can our nations come together to solve global problems? Climate change will have impacts all around the globe, as will automation and advances in healthcare that could extend the human lifespan. We'll have to come together to tackle these problems or risk paying the consequences alone. In part three, Despair and Hope, we take a look at what happens when communities come into conflict. The threat of terrorism and war still threaten us, and in some ways we've built or worsened the conditions for them to occur. I probably don't have to do much to convince you to buy the despair part of this section. War and terrorism are near universally feared threats, but I do want to spend some time on Harari's turn to hope. We like to describe human history as a carefully orchestrated series of moves and counter moves. Country A crosses a border, country B defends, war ensues. But the reality is that much of human history has been driven by people making decisions with bad information or having bad beliefs. An authoritarian ruler who really believes he should control his part of the world may feel totally justified in killing his own people or invading a neighbor, but that rationality falls apart to an outside observer. Even in less malevolent contexts, many cultures believe that the world turns around them. We know that there were people and events happening that aren't mentioned in the Christian Old Testament, but most churches don't have history classes to contextualize the Bible. They generally believe they've got all the important stuff captured. As Harari mentions in the book, some Hindus claim that their ancient sages invented airplanes, rockets, and even nuclear physics. The Aztecs really believe that human sacrifices to the gods sustained the universe. In light of what we know we've been wrong about, Harari wisely includes a chapter on humility in the Despair and Hope section. It behooves us to be aware of how limited our perspective can be. For anything and everything we believe, we should test ourselves with outside perspectives and facts. And if we are ever sure that our view is 100% unequivocally right, we're almost certainly somewhat wrong. But how do you test your belief in a world of information overload and fake news? That's a great question and the topic of part four, truth. Most of our modern systems are based on the idea that we're informed in the decisions we make. Liberal democracy counts on the informed voter. Employer-driven retirement savings like 401ks and IRAs require an informed investor, and consumer-driven health care requires an informed patient. But of course, the problem is that we can't be informed about everything all the time. There's just not enough hours in the day. So instead, we rely on best guesses and social cues on what decisions we should make. Unfortunately, that can lead us very far astray. It makes us susceptible to good salesmanship and bad information. And even trying to educate the population probably won't fix it. As Harari points out, most people don't like too many facts, and they certainly don't like feeling stupid. Ignorance then becomes a personal problem requiring personal solutions. To quote the book again, it is the responsibility of all of us to invest time and effort in uncovering our biases and in verifying our sources of information. Harari gives two specific recommendations. Number one, pay for your news. If information is free, you need to be wary of why it's being given away and whether there's an agenda there. And number two, seek out scientific opinion. That's not to say that a scientist can't be wrong, but the process of academic review and public scrutiny in the scientific community is a better stopgap than most any other system. Finally, we turn to the last section, part five, resilience. How are we going to move forward as individuals in a world filled with all this uncertainty? One way is education. Not just the memorization and recitation of facts and dates that many of us learned in school, but learning how to think critically about information and ideas. Harari says that change itself is the only certainty. There's no way that you'll know exactly the facts that you'll need in 10 years. So learn to comb through the onslaught of information and find what's really important, which 
Speaking of which, another way is to make sure that you know what's really important. We each, as individuals, need to figure out the story that drives us. That might be a big story that we're adopting from the world, a faith system, or national identity, but it doesn't have to be. Harari spells out the two requirements that any good story needs to have. First, we have to have a role to play. It has to say something about me, who I am, and why I'm here. And then second, it has to extend beyond me. My story has to put me in context to my community and to my world. How should I be interacting with others, and what should I be contributing? In all of that, I see something incredible. Not only can we choose our own story, but we're each responsible for the story that we've chosen. If your story says that you're superior to those around you and that exploiting others is justified, okay, but you choose that story. There are most likely consequences for that life, and you've got to own those. When I think about my story, it influences me at my job, as a member of my community, and as a citizen of my country. I can't help but make decisions at work or vote that are in accordance with my story. I've come to see my story as reflective of the deepest values that I hold. And that's why I'm so happy with Harari's final chapter, titled Meditation. If your story is to be reflective of what you believe most deeply, you need to spend some time alone with your thoughts to find out what those beliefs are. Our world doesn't make it easy. Technology and advertising have become so much more intrusive, and we have a million ways to fill every available moment to avoid boredom. Most of us walk around with an attention leech called a smartphone in our pockets. But if you look at many of the people creating this world, you'll see they're not walking the talk. The CEO of Twitter, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, the list goes on. The Silicon Valley geniuses that built the attention economy take trips to ashrams and go away for silent meditation retreats. They've recognized the harmful effects of their products and, like drug dealers who never use, have worked to avoid the harms of addiction. But here's what I really love about meditation the most. It is the most accessible thing in the world. Throughout this book, there's a very specific thread. We start with the global threats to humanity. Not much I can do about that. And then we turn to the communities we build when millions of us share a common story. And then the threats that arise when those communities conflict. But again, mostly out of my personal control. But then we decide who to trust and what to believe. Here, we finally have something we can control. It's up to us to be active players in deciding what's real. And we do that by knowing the version of reality, the story, that we believe. And the only way to get there is to take personal action, to find our own truth and choose our own story. It reminds me of a quote you've probably heard. It's from the tomb of an Anglican bishop in Westminster Abbey. It goes, When I was young and free and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years, in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now I realize as I lie on my deathbed, if I had only changed myself first, that by example I might have changed my family, from their inspiration and encouragement I would then have been able to better my country, and who knows, I might have even changed the world. The only place we can start is with ourselves. I can, and in fact am responsible, for doing the work to understand what I really believe, why, and what that means about my place in the world. If I and you choose to live our lives according to a story that promotes the welfare of others, we will seek out others that share our story. That story becomes a movement that unifies us into communities, and when two communities sharing that story come together, we avoid the conflict of war and violence. Together, those communities could face the uncertainties that are coming what it means to be human when we can remake ourselves on the genetic level, what happens when technology begins to outthink us and the nature of work changes around us, we can have a society that believes that the value of human life and happiness is of at least equal weight to economic value. I believe that that's the most important lesson of all for the 21st century. As Harari explored in his work Homo Deus, the power we now wield would rightly be called godlike by many of our ancestors. We amass knowledge at an incredible rate and reshape the environment to our liking. We've begun to manipulate our own biology and soon could reach out to the stars. The question remains, what stories will get us past the immediate threats of the present? And what stories will take us beyond? It has to start with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Reading for Your Life. Later in February, I'll be sharing Atul Gawande's Being Mortal, a book about the limits of medicine and how hard it can be for us to let go of this thing called life. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast 
and drop me a line on social media at Alex P. Acton on Instagram or Twitter. Tell me your thoughts, how you've decided on your story, or recommend a book that's taught you important lessons for your life. You can also keep up with future shows at Modern Polymaths on Twitter and Modern Polymaths Media on Facebook. Until next time, thanks for listening. Keep reading, and I wish you the best life imaginable.